Dollar cost averaging is just all right, particularly when it comes to building your wealth. That's it. That's the video. Oh, uh, you wanted to know why and what even is dollar cost averaging? Well, I guess I'll take some time to explain it all to you in an entertaining and informative way. You happy now? Plus, if you stick around to the end, I'll tell you what to do instead. So, lovingly, gently, tenderly, caress that like button for the YouTube algorithm, and let's get started. You're watching Finance Squared, and I'm your lovable host, Derek West. On this channel, we love to talk about anything and everything personal finance related. Whether it's stocks, bonds, getting into debt, staying out of debt, cryptocurrency, alt currency, and so much more. If you're into that, be sure to subscribe and turn on post notifications. It helps us deliver only the best content to you, and we definitely appreciate it. So, what is dollar cost averaging? It can definitely be an overloaded term in the finance zeitgeist, but basically it means hedging the risk of buying an investment instrument that goes south by instead of buying it all at once at a point in time, by into it slowly, splitting your investment up into regular chunks to purchase again and again and again. An interesting technique and a lot can be said about why it works. Many people advocate for using that technique to invest into anything from stocks to Bitcoin. But like anything else, dollar cost averaging has its pluses and its minuses. Let me explain. We already mentioned that dollar cost averaging is designed to better manage the risk of buying into investment, it immediately going down, and you then selling out of frustration that the stock went down the second you invested the money. You see, it's a psychological technique. A lot of folks don't realize a lot of investment techniques and tools are really just ways and attempts to mask the downside risks of investments, which are substantial and are very psychologically damaging. And dollar cost averaging is definitely in that category. You can consider dollar cost averaging as investing mechanically for consistency, building up your habit for paying yourself and consistently investing, taking the emotional component out of your investing decisions and life, and just purchasing that investment without regards to how wildly the price swings, keeping you from bailing out of the investment when it inevitably takes a downswing. And more on that in a few moments. Dollar cost averaging also helps people to avoid bad timing. A lot of people have a misconception that investing is about buying an investment before it goes up and selling it before it goes down, which indeed is what investing has become which is really a bad way to look at investing. You see, taking that worldview of investing encourages you to do the time-honored, failed tradition of trying to time the market, any market really, stocks, housing, crypto, any market. Investing should be all about increasing your wealth, in which case, wouldn't you wanna buy something when it's on sale? But imagine if you had started to purchase stocks right before the crash of 2008, or even more recently, the crash that started in March 2020. In both instances, more than likely, if you rode out all the way to the bottom, your investment would have been halved or more, and the temptation for you to bail out would have been too strong, even for the most well-educated investors. And a lot of folks would have just pulled out of the whole thing. But here's the rub. As the stock market started to go back up in 2009, and more recently, at the end of 2020, you would not have had the impetus to get back in, as you would have been traumatized psychologically, and you likely would have missed out on the gains that both markets would have had. You see, for long-term investing, timing the market is a very hard thing to do. And yeah, people do do it. Lots of people do it as a matter of fact, but most of them are seasoned, trained pros who follow market making signals all day, looking for the opportunity to make the right move when the market is in just the right position. And even of all of those folks, only the best of the best of the best can reliably predict when a stock is about to tank and then pull out all their investments and buy in when the investment is about to go up. And that is why your average investor, who may be slightly squeamish, about losing their investments immediately. Dollar cost averaging is a decent technique for them to get started investing with. But like everything in the real world, dollar cost averaging has a couple of downsides. Downsides that in my mind make it a poor technique for, for investors of most stripes, with one or two exceptions, which I will go over. Keeping in mind, markets rise over time. Whether it's the real estate market, stocks, or even crypto, if there's a market for it, it tends to rise over time, which is a good thing, particularly if you invest in and ride out all the negative swings and fanciful rises. But if you only invest a little bit initially, then you buy in more later. You have less buying power now than you did earlier, particularly if you're investing the same amount. And the reason why this is, is the cost of the investment has gone up while the amount that you're investing has stayed stagnant. So a quick example, if you're looking to buy a stock or a cryptocurrency that is worth $500, now we're not talking about Bitcoin obviously, and you wanted to avoid looking like a fool when it goes down, you would split up that investment into five easy installments of just 99, 99, 99. <laughs> Sorry about that, reboot flashback. Basically $100 for each of those five installments. There is a possibility that the investment, the problem with that strategy is that there is a possibility, and in fact a likelihood, that the investment could go up to $550 in between investment installment one 
an investment installment too. But you still have $100 to invest with in installment number two. However, for that second installment, your $100 can buy less of that investment. It gets even worse if the price goes up even further and, it, and better if it falls, as you might imagine. The other downside of this strategy is that it's still terrible even if you buy it in installment plans, even if you use dollar cost averaging to purchase your investments. If the investment goes to zero, you still lost your money in the investment and the investment is worthless. Yes, you would not have lost as much money as if you had invested it all at one time. For example, with our $500 investment, if you invested $100 and the price goes down to $250, you can now buy twice the amount of that investment. But imagine after the second investment installment, after you paid $200 for that stock or that cryptocurrency, for example. If the investment goes to zero, in other words, the company goes bankrupt and is liquidated, or if the cryptocurrency is just abandoned by all of its users, then your investment is still worthless. You just didn't lose all $500 when you bought in. You still have $300 left to make other investment purchases. Again, that's a good thing, but you still didn't pick a winning investment. You picked an investment that lost. You just managed not to lose that much money. So the answer isn't only about spreading the risk, it's about picking better investments. But there are obvious exceptions to this rule, particularly when you're starting out and you have little capital to get started with investing. In this case, dollar cost averaging is really the only game in town, particularly if you want to buy into a nice index fund or a really good solid blue chip stock. Those things are expensive and not for the faint of heart. Most people who start out with a 401k or an IRA or other retirement vehicles and invest into some target fund or other similar investment are really doing dollar cost averaging. When you buy into fractional shares of a company stock, you're really dollar cost averaging your investment, assuming you plan on owning the whole thing eventually. And that's definitely the case for anyone looking to buy any Bitcoin at the moment. As of right now, Bitcoin is one of the most expensive things on earth, and quite literally. It's also stripping gold, silver, platinum, you name it, in terms of per unit price. The only thing more expensive and almost as useless are Lamborghinis. I can hear all the crypto geeks gently crying into their pillowcases. I'm kidding, folks. But if you want to hold some Bitcoin and you don't have the $40,000 just lying around somewhere, you have to buy it fractionally, buying more when the price drops and less when it rises, but at all times consistently buying until you reach your goal of owning one Bitcoin. Now, of course, there is mining, but that also has huge upfront investments in high-end mining hardware, and no, not picks and shovels, but graphics cards and motherboards. So what do you do instead? Well, we talked about the fact that as you're starting out and you have little capital and you want to buy expensive investing instruments, then you have to buy in using dollar cost averaging. But if you're willing to expand your horizons and invest in instruments that are in your price range, there's plenty you can do. For example, ETFs and index funds. In the event you don't have a ton of funds just lying around the house, you could instead purchase a broad-based index fund or a broad-based ETF. And just a quick primer, index funds are really mutual funds that track an index. If you purchase an index fund that tracks a broad index like the S&P 500, you're really buying into a mutual fund that owns all those stocks in a certain proportion. However, quite a few index funds can be expensive to get into, as some require minimum investment amounts. Now, I'll say this, that has been changing lately as individual brokerages and investment companies such as Charles Schwab and Robinhood have been trying to entice investors to use their platforms over other platforms. And they've been brutally fighting with each other to offer their index funds with waived fees. You do have the opportunity to buy into some index funds with waived fees, so there's that. But you also could purchase an ETF. Now, an ETF is similar to an index fund, only it can be traded throughout the day instead of at the close of the investment day, like with index funds and ETFs typically have no investment minimums. And then there are altcoins. You don't have the dollar cost average you're buying into Bitcoin. Bitcoin has several competitors that are worthwhile and can be great investments, as I'm sure you know. But if you browse Coindesk, you can easily find altcoins that are popular and can be purchased at reasonable prices, assuming you have a wallet that will allow for you to hold their currencies. For example, Stellar looks like a cryptocurrency on the rise, along with Chainlink. Ethereum is also ever popular, if not somewhat expensive in and of itself and approaching the value of gold. But that's not the only thing that you can purchase. You can purchase small cap and growth index fund ETFs. Now I'm a fan of buying index funds and ETFs in general. And in my mind, the simpler you can keep it without getting too fancy, the more likely that you are to be successful with that strategy. As long as you keep investing in the instrument and don't lose your nerve when the market takes a dive. But if you wanna get fancy with it and see if you can't optimize your wealth building strategy, you can invest in small cap index funds and growth index funds and ETFs. Some popular ones are the iShares Russell 2000 ETF, the SPDR S&P 600 Small Cap ETF, Vanguard Russell 2000 ETF, and Vanguard Small Cap Index Fund. Just in case you're wondering, I'm not sponsored by any company for mentioning any index fund or ETF, and I'm not getting any affiliate commission either. I'm just letting you know what index funds and ETFs are highly rated in terms of liquidity, cost, and diversification. There are many alternatives to the ones I listed that you can explore and add into your mix of index fund and ETF holdings. Then there are small cap growth stocks. 
There is no real official definition for a small cap stock. A popular rule of thumb puts them between 500 million and 200 billion in market capitalization, with the market capitalization being the price of the current, the current price of the stock times the current number of shares outstanding. But buying a share in a small cap stock typically doesn't require you to mortgage your house or sell a kidney, thus making them nice and attractive targets for the people who want to own a whole stock of a company and not a fractional share. One thing I will say that it is really, 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 and I mean really, really, really hard to pick stocks that will do well and not tank. Professionals across the globe have been trying to do it for hundreds of years. I don't know if it's been hundreds of years actually, but they've been trying for a really long time. And it would seem that most people picking stocks simply cannot beat indexes over a long period of time. Every once in a while, someone will come along who can beat the market. As an example, a guy like Warren Buffett. But he and they are few and far between. That's especially true if you don't have the time to sit down and do copious amounts of research. You're just better off putting most of your wealth into a one, two, or three index fund strategy. But if you still want to be adventurous, yes, it is possible that you could pick a single stock that does really well and turns you into a millionaire. But the chances are similar to winning the lottery. That is to say, you're more than likely to pick a loser than a winner. So what would be a winning strategy without relying on dollar cost averaging? Start with adjusting your psychology to investment fundamentals and not the other way around. In other words, dollar cost averaging might be a necessity when you first start out as you more than likely do not have any capital to begin with. But as you get capital, get your psychology right. Markets have swings and volatilities, whether it's crypto like Bitcoin that has wild fluctuations seemingly daily, or the tried and true stock markets, which also seem to have wild fluctuations seemingly daily. Most investments rise, particularly the stock market. And if you stick with and are willing to go to zero, that is, have the steely eyed constitution to ride the stock all the way to the bottom, then you will in the end come out a winner. Next, you want to buy investments that you can afford. There are a number of investments out there. We talked about a couple of them in this video, and a lot of them are not very expensive at all. Whether you're talking about no fee index funds or ETFs, altcoins that have reasonable upside, small cap stocks, etc. Research them, buy them, hold them. Also, a key to any investment strategy is to keep learning. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is to subscribe to this YouTube channel and turn on post notifications as we endeavor to learn more and teach more about investing and also give out our extensive knowledge of investing from the experience we have gathered, mostly me, from investing our hard-earned dollar. In the near future, we have videos coming out on advanced investing techniques, altcoins, debt management, and starting a small business as an investment. And you're not going to want to miss it. So remember, a goal without a plan is a wish. A goal with a plan and no action is a wish list. Take action on your investment goals. Use dollar cost averaging if you must, particularly when you're starting out, but don't use it as a crutch. Instead, adjust your investing psyche to be rock solid. And we'll catch you next time. Peace.